Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome people in person and also uh, online. We thank God for this opportunity to study the book of Revelations. And again, we have Pastor Shaver. Thank you, God. And let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for today, Sunday, and you bless us this opportunity to get deeper into your words. And we're thankful for Pastor Shaver, who invested lots of time and effort before you to prepare these lessons. May you bless him and anoint his words, and may, I, may we really pay attention to what you're teaching us, especially the power of prayers. Let us have faith, keep praying for those around us, especially for the ones who really need you. And we ask you to bless today's time. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. And here's Pastor Shaver, thank you. Thank you, Diana, for all the work you do in keeping all this organized. Thank you, all of you, for being here today. I realize this is a holiday weekend, and many people are out of town, I suppose. Plus, they could have looked outside and said, oh, it's a, uh, it, it's a, uh, it's a wet day or going to be a wet day. I, I, can't, I can't risk getting out in the rain. I'm just kidding, but, but uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be able to teach today. Uh, from I, for, I realized as I looked at the title sl slide, I forgot to put the actual chapters. We're going to do our best to cover as much as possible of chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11. So we'll start in just a moment with Revelation 8, if you want to keep your Bible open. And uh, we'll go through 8, 9, 10, and 11. I apologize for forgetting to put the actual uh, chapters there in the t on the title slide. Um, let me say one more thing. I am deliberately breaking one of the rules of PowerPoint presentations. If you, if you go to any kind of a class, and I've had a couple of short things, but if you go to any kind of class about how to use PowerPoint, they'll say you should have one idea in as few words as possible on each slide. Maybe an illustration or a picture or something, and then one idea, one idea. But what I'm doing is I want to provide for you enough material that you can go back and meaningfully study what is already, what's already been said. So I'm, I'm putting lots of information on each of the slides, and it's more, think of it more as a, a kind of a study guide than a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I know that uh, I'm making available, I, just for the first time today, I'm making available all five of the PowerPoints that's up to today. By the way, we're together for nine weeks. Think about it. Whenever you start with an odd number, it's easy to get an exact center, right? So this is week five, which means we finished four weeks. We have four weeks ahead. We're in the exact center of our study today. And then uh, I'm looking forward to uh, what yet is to come. But remember, we're trying to jam 22 chapters of some of the most dense writing. I don't mean dense in the sense of stupid, but I mean condensed so that every word counts. There are no spare words in Revelation. And, um, and it's a summary of the whole Bible. And so we're, we're dealing with some of the most packed material that you'll find in any book of the Bible. And that being the case, to try to pack 22 chapters into nine weeks means that we've got a lot of work to do each time. So today we're covering four chapters. And by the way, I'm going to teach until we run out of time. And then if there's some material left over, uh, Diana has, has uh, graciously agreed to send out the, the PowerPoint for today to everyone. And you can finish the study for yourself. Hopefully I will have given you enough principles through the day. Uh, through the morning, that you'll be able to keep applying those principles and understand whatever r slides remain if I don't get to cover everything. And uh, so uh, we'll just do it that way. From, and then next week, we're only looking at three chapters, and then we're back, I think, to two chapters for the remaining Sunday. So thank the Lord we can slow down a little bit as we um, approach the end where there are some glorious things for us to be looking at. So today, the power of prayer. And uh, you'll notice then four chapters we're covering, six topics. I've got them listed for you there. But one great story. And what is that great story? It is the victory of the new covenant in Christ. That's the great story. That the new covenant that is sealed for us in the blood of Jesus Christ overcomes the world. Well, we'll talk about that more. Let's move on to the beginning of today's text. I'm going to go a little slower at first. Because, as I say, the more I can build certain principles of biblical uh, study or Bible study into your mind and heart, the better you can handle everything I'm giving you, both in the past and in the future. So we'll start with one verse, chapter 8, verse 1. When the Lamb, that would be Christ, of course. Remember, 
all the way back in chapter 5, they, they, there was a book in the hand of, of, of God on the throne. Recall that? And, and uh, John wept much because no one could open that, could break the seals and open the book. And then the angel says to John, stop weeping because the lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome. He is qualified to break the seals, to open the book, and apply the, all of the legal, uh, all the legal statements that are made in the book. And so uh, remember in the previous chapters, the Lamb of God was opening one seal after another. We got down to the sixth seal last week. Today, the Lamb opened the seventh seal. And what happened? There was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I'm not even kidding. You would not believe how many people have just gone all kinds of crazy speculating on what that silence in heaven might have been. And there have been lots of jokes made about it, but all of them are quite sexist, and I won't repeat them now because we live in a world where that is the unforgivable sin, you know, to be sexist, and so we won't do that. But let me just give you a little hint as to how these things are going to go here. First of all, notice that in Revelation we have seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And I've deliberately put these in such an order that, as you can see, when the seventh seal is open, we're going to see this in a moment in today's study, when the seventh seal is open, then all of a sudden you hear the blast from seven trumpets. So what we uh, can assume then is that the seven trumpets are contained in the seventh seal. They are released by the seventh seal. And then later we're going to have the seven bowls of God's wrath that are poured out on the earth. And they are contained in the seventh trumpet. And so that's the way this kind of works. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Then when he opens the seventh seal, out come seven angels with seven trumpets and seven trumpet judgments. And then the wrath of God comes out of the seventh trumpet blast. And that makes good sense logically, and I hope you'll see eventually it makes really good sense biblically. Now let's talk about the 30 minutes of silence in heaven. Remember, John is viewing heaven on the Lord's day. And he's caught up into heaven, and he sees a service going on in the heavenly temple. But we need to understand this is a transitional service. That is, the, the old covenant form of worship would still prevail in heaven for John to observe because it would be what he understood. But now, for the purpose of judgment on covenant-breaking Israel, before you worship God, and because you worship God, he blessed you for worshiping him. But now, Israel is under judgment, and this is a, a worship service that is aimed at pouring out the judgment of God on covenant-breaking Israel. But remember, Old Testament worship was directly modeled on the heavenly worship from the very beginning. Now, let me just remind you then of a couple of passages of Scripture. The first one from 1 Chronicles 24, 19, where the chronicler writes these, and he's referencing the 24 courses of priests that were set up by David all the way back in his day that were still prevailing in the time of Christ. Remember Zechariah at the beginning of Luke chapter 1? Zechariah was in one of those courses, and it fell to his assignment to offer the prayer of incense or the, the offering of incense on that particular day, one of the highest honors that a priest could ever experience. It, they received that honor by lot. Those who were qualified would receive that honor by lot. Some men went their whole lifetime, some priests went their whole lifetime and were never permitted to actually offer the incense at the time of prayer. But Zechariah did, and that's what we're seeing here. So these 24 courses of priests had as their appointed duty in their service to come into the house of the Lord, according to the procedure established for them by Aaron, their father. It goes all the way back to Moses. I, I said David, and you'll see David in just a moment. I was getting ahead of myself. Procedure established for them by Aaron, their father, as the Lord God of Israel had commanded him. So what we understand then is that the the... Uh, the, the liturgy of the Old Testament worship was established by God and was given to Aaron, and they had been practicing this from the time of the tabernacle on. But remember that David has now moved the worship of God, or is moving the worship of God, from the tabernacle to the temple that he prepared for Solomon to build. And so in 1 Chronicles 28, 11, David is finishing up his ministry. He's just about to die, and he's passing on all this information to Solomon, and he gives Solomon his son, notice what it says here, the plan of the vestibule of the temple and the rest of it, and then verse 13, also the plan for the divisions of the priests and of the Levites and all the work of the service in the house of the Lord, but verse 19 is so important. All this, David said, I have in writing from the hand of the Lord upon me, and he gave me understanding of all the details of the plan. So the Old Testament worship 
uh, service has always mirrored what was already going on in heaven. So what can we say about the 30 minutes of silence in heaven then? Well, the worship of heaven corresponds to the daily temple service, which the Jews in Jesus' day fully understood. They were practicing it all the time. The high point was a solemn processional into the temple by several priests. This is just before they would offer the incense on the golden altar inside the holy place to God himself. Each would be bearing the different elements for the offering of incense, so there would be fire from the altar outside. We're going to say more about that altar and where that fire came from a little bit later. Fire from the altar outside. They would be bringing the incense that would be placed in the censer. Somebody else would be carrying the censer. and There'd be several priests uh, going through all of this. And then all the priests but one would back out of the holy place of the temple with many signs of worship, bowing and raising their hands and so forth. They would bow and, and back out of the temple. And then the, the chief officiating priest, like Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, as I've mentioned, he would, he would wait for a signal from outside that all was ready for the time of incense. I personally don't know what that signal would have been. I don't know if somebody clapped their hands. I don't know if anybody said go. I don't know what they said. I don't know what it was, but he would wait for the signal for the time of incense. And as the incense was offered in the holy place, the people outside would often fall flat in silent worship and, uh, and, uh, and prayer. And this comes from uh, some, uh, there was a Jewish scholar who converted to Christianity called Alfred Adersheim. Have any of you seen his? Uh, he wrote a book called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah that's, I'm not even kidding, yay thick. Four inches, I think, at least. It's a huge book. Uh, now, uh, by, uh, by the way, out of copyright, you can download the whole thing if you want, but uh, for free. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but Alfred Adersheim also wrote a book about the temple and how it was built in Jesus' day and all the worship services and all that. So what I'm giving you comes from Adersheim's book on the temple. But notice this, as the incense was offered, the people outside would fall flat on their faces. They were outdoors, but they would fall flat in the courtyard there outside in the temple in silent worship and prayer. Most of the time, the courtyard was full of people milling around, talking. There would be all kinds of noise. Think about a noisy restaurant and, and how, you know, ordinary conversations can lead to a lot of noise, there, but not during this period. Then it would be completely silent. And guess what? According to Adersheim, the whole process would have taken about a half hour. Hmm. Do you think John might have been referencing in heaven what the Jews were used to experiencing at the temple on a daily basis? All right, so let's go back to today's text as we move on. We've talked about the silence in heaven. One of the things I'm trying to emphasize is this, that if we look at God's word, the Old Testament, if we study enough of the Old Testament, we'll understand Revelation. Don't study your newspaper. Study the Old Testament if you want to understand Revelation. Now, chapter 8, verse 2, Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer. Now, do you see why we're talking about the golden the altar and the, the time of prayer and the, and, and the incense and so forth? This is happening in heaven it was, as it was doing on earth already, as people had already seen on earth. Anyway, given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then notice what happens next. The angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now, before we actually go back and expound that particular verse, I want to emphasize a couple of things. So let's talk about when the trumpets first blew. We've had the seven trumpets introduced just now. So is, are there trumpets in the Old Testament? Absolutely they are, there are. And so they were, and to note, I want you to notice this, they were trumpets of judgment. For example, from no, Numbers 31. So if you'll remember, they're conquering, by now they're conquering, um, uh, they're conquering their way on their way to the, whole, the promised land. And Moses sent the Israelites, soldiers, to war against Midian, a thousand from each tribe, together with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, with the vessels of the sanctuary, and the trumpets for the alarm in his hand. Now this one, they were specifically sent out. Uh, God had said, you've got to destroy Midian because of their sin and one thing or another. And they went as a, an army of judgment. And to announce God, this is God's army of judgment. And God's judgment upon Midian, they blew trumpets. So trumpets in the Old Testament symbolize more than anything else judgment. Let me, let's keep on. Joshua chapter 6. 
Remember Israel walking around Jericho as they're getting ready to enter the promised land, walking around Jericho one time a day for six days on the seventh day. They walk around Jericho for seven times. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city of Jericho seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up everyone straight before them. By now they've been, you know, whenever you've got a big crowd of people walking somewhere, it tends to string out, right? They've walked around Jericho seven times. Now, by now, the Jewish people, the Jewish men are completely surrounding the city. They've strung out as they've walked. They're surrounding the city, and when the walls fall down, they can all go straight in. Now, there's another scripture. I'm just showing you trumpets signify the judgment of God. You said, with the judgment of God on Jericho? Absolutely. It was the first Canaanite city they came to. And if you'll remember, God said to Abraham, someday your people will come back 400 years from now, and they will destroy these cities. They will conquer them. They won't do it yet. And I'm quoting now, as God spoke to Abraham, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, God gave them 400 more years, either to fill up their iniquity or to repent of their sin, one way or the other. And, of course, they filled up their iniquity, so Jer Jericho and the cities that followed were all under God's judgment, and they always attacked with the blowing of the trumpets. And then, of course, in the period of the judges, when Midian has come and they're, they're destroying Israel, and God raises up one of the judges, one of the early judges that he raises up is this man named Gideon. We're all familiar with the story, how Gideon starts with, I forget now, but 30,000 or so soldiers, and he winnows it down to 300 and, uh, and, and then what does, God, what does Gideon say in Judges 7, 18? When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon, the judgment of God upon Midian again. So now we've looked at when the trumpets first blew, and we understand they were trumpets of judgment. Now let's look at when the fire first fell. Let's see where the fire comes from, this fire that is used in, uh, in Revelation and also uh, on earth. When the fire first fell, we're looking now at the dedication of the tabernacle. What happens? Fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering. Where did the fire come from? From the fire of heaven. The fire, what, what do we see in heaven? We see the seven fires of the Holy Spirit, the seven torches. They are burning before God. All right, so fire comes out from before the Lord, then Judges 6.21. And uh, what we're looking at here is the story of the calling of, or the announcement that the angel of the Lord, who is Christ in a pre-incarnate uh, appearance, and he explains to Manoah and Manoah's wife that they're going to have a son, he's going to be supernaturally strong and so forth, and they give an offering, and then it says that the angel of the Lord reached out, he touches the offering, and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the cakes. This is fire from heaven. And then, and, and the offering is consumed then in heavenly fire. And then First Chronicles, when uh, David then is praying, the Lord, uh, he's, he's establishing the very spot, dedicating the place where the temple is going to be built, Arana's threshing floor, if you'll recall. And the Lord answered David. He, builds, he puts the sacrifice together, and, and there, there's the wood, and there's the meat, uh, the, the slain bullocks that are there. And the Lord answered David with fire from heaven upon the altar of burnt offering. And then 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings. This is at the dedication of the temple uh, after David's death and Solomon builds the temple. So you can see then that along, all along the way, the worship of God was enabled by the supernatural fire that came from heaven itself. And the, what the priests did in those days, they were very, very careful to keep the fire of the altar burning because this was sacred fire. This was fire that had been lit from heaven. And the other thing that's interesting is that whenever they went to a place like when they destroyed Jericho, at the end of the, of the battle that day, they took all of the wealth of Jericho and piled it in the center of, of the city, and they piled wood all over it, and they lit the fire from the fire of the altar, indicating that the fire from heaven was destroying this sin and these sinful people, and, uh, and it came from heaven and consumed the, uh, the burnt offerings. And so this is the way. Now, one of the things that's quite interesting, and it's kind of a sidelight, but when the Israelites came back from their uh, exile in Babylon, they rebuilt the temple, but it was a pitiful little thing. It was nothing compared to what was later 
Herod, if you'll recall, enlarged it and rebuilt it and beautified it and so forth. But it was a pitiful little thing compared to Solomon's temple. And the scripture does not record that any holy fire lit the offering when that temple was rededicated. That from then on it was just man's fire. Just man's fire. The, the holy fire, the heavenly fire was reserved for heaven from that point on. Now, the seven angels then blow seven trumpets. And what I want us to see here is that the seven angels blow trumpets of judgment just as the seven angels or messengers of the churches in Re Revelation 1.20 are to pronounce God's judgment upon the world. One of the fascinating things is that during the time of Reformation, during the time of the Puritans, during the times of great revivals, our historians, Christian historians, record that the pastors in the pulpit, their words were like trumpet blasts, pronouncing judgment upon sin and upon sinners and calling people to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to understand is going on here, these seven trumpets. Think of the destruction of Jericho. The flame was lit from the altar, as I've explained to you. Judgment is to be done with holy fire from heaven in the context of worship, including the preaching. And I'm going to show you something more about that in just a moment. But judgment is precisely what we see happening to Jerusalem. So what do we see then? That trumpets, fire, and judgment fall upon the earth from, say, 66, and I'll give you that number in just a moment, from 66 A.D. until 70 A.D. Judgment, uh, fire, trumpet, fire, judgment, all of it falls upon the earth, but all of it in response to prayer. Remember how chapter 8 talks about that? The angel scoops up the fire from the altar, pours it out on the earth, and so forth. So God's worship and God's warfare are intertwined, and we need to keep that in mind right now because let's be clear about something. The world is implacably opposed to Jesus, Jesus Christ. And, and there are some leaders in our world today who emphatically say, I hate Christianity. I hate the idea of Jesus. I deny that he even lived. I deny that he rose from the dead. And I want to kill everybody who names the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior. There are leaders like that, and you know the names of some of them. There are other leaders who say, well, we love everybody. But in the name of love, we can't allow the Christians to make trouble in our society because if they talk about Jesus as the only Savior, if they talk about Jesus as the only one who died for the sins of the world, that's exclusive. They're haters. We have to stop their hate. We have to shut them up. We have to silence them. Well, they can't silence us in prayer. They can't silence us unless they kill us. They shouldn't be able to silence us at all. And so I'm just suggesting, though, that we need to get it back in our minds that God's worship and God's warfare are intertwined and we can cry out to God as the saints under the altar do in, back in chapter 6. Remember, we covered that last week. But we can cry out to God as the saints under the altar do. We can cry out to God for help and we can know that God in his heavenly throne room where the worship of God goes on purely and continuously, we can understand that God will respond to his people. God's worship and God's warfare are intertwined. The worship of the churches then is cosmically significant. I wish I had time to read for, to you some of the history that Christian historians, and maybe before we're done I will later in, in our time together, Christian historians have, have uh, actually studied the relationship between the prayers of God's people in the time of the Roman Empire before Constantine, before Christians were given tolerance in the, in the empire, as they cried out to God and the various Roman leaders that died in horrible ways simply because God's people had asked for relief and asked for help. So the worship of the churches is cosmically significant. We need to pray for what's going on in our world and ask for God's judgment to be displayed and believe that it will. So let us learn to call upon the Lord of the covenant. And I hope that before we're done here, your confidence in the covenant that was established in Christ, the covenant then that, is, that in, implies the salvation of the world, that your confidence will grow and that you'll call upon the Lord of the covenant in the name of the, the, one, the Lamb of God who seals the covenant with his own blood, who rose from the dead, who reigns from his throne, who will then be ready to respond to our prayers and extend his reign on the earth through us. So for the sake of his name, let us seek the outpouring of his power. So that's the sermon for the morning. I'll stop preaching now. My wife always says, you know, you started preaching a little bit yesterday. <laughs> You're supposed to be teaching. So I'll, I'll stop preaching and I'll start teaching. All right. Uh, so let's, let's talk about the four trumpets then for just a moment. I'm going to summarize these. We don't have time to read everything. The first trumpet, and I've, you see the scripture references and I won't bother to give each one. But the first trumpet, when it blows, there's hail and fire mixed with blood and a third of the land was burned. Uh, again, almost everywhere in Revelation where you see the word earth, 
God help us, but so many people have seen things, about references to the earth in Revelation, and they haven't looked at the Greek word behind it, and they haven't looked at the Old Testament context of that Greek word, and they, cons they assume that the word earth means the whole earth. Every, you know, everything from the international date line all the way back around to the international date line. That's not what is referencing here. We're talking about the land. We're talking about the holy land. And so uh, a third of the land was burned, including all the green grass on a third of the land. Second trumpet, a great mountain burning with fire, thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood. A third of the creatures die. Ships sink, etc. Third trumpet, a blazing star. The Greek word is wormwood, bitter fell on a third of the rivers and springs in the Holy Land. The water becomes bitter and many people die from drinking it. Fourth trumpet, a third of the light of the heavenly luminaries, that is sun, moon, and stars, is lost so that it's always darker than it used to be uh, or that it sh than it should be. What are these trumpet blasts and all this judgment? Let's explain it. These judgments are designed to remind the reader of God's judgment against Egypt, as you read through the, 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 the several trumpets there that are in this chapter, you're going to discover that over and over again, you're reminded of the plagues that, you, that God used when he judged Egypt and said, let my people go. Remember how that went? But this time, the judgment is not against Egypt, but against Israel. Because as we're going to see later on, Israel is compared, directly compared to Egypt in its, its idolatry and its rebellion and so forth. Some of these judgments combine imagery from judgment on Babylon with judgment against Egypt. And I've given you some references. You can look them, look them up later. The darkness depicts the fall of nations and national rulers. By the way, Revelation contains threats from God against not just Israel but also Rome because in many cases, and I won't belabor the point today, but later we'll make more of an issue of it, Rome and, and, and uh, Israel were in cahoots. Believe it or not, even though Rome and Israel were fighting each other, they were also in cahoots. Uh, together against the Christians everywhere. And, uh, and so, by the way, remember I talked to you last week about uh, this, this whole concept of, of the deconstruction of creation, or the decreation. Remember I gave you that principle last week? So what we're seeing again is some of that here, the decreation. Darkness indicates that the sun is failing, at least as regard to Israel and so forth. These judgments are neither, and this is really important, I think, these judgments are neither total nor final. Therefore, this cannot be the end of the physical world. This is not the destruction of the world. But they do herald the end of the Jewish nation of, you might say, the Jewish world. And then finally, Israel has become a nation of Egyptians and Canaanites. Worse, it has become a land of covenant apostates. They had the old covenant. If they really believed, as Jesus himself specifically says in the Gospels, if you believed Moses... If you believed, if you truly understood and believed the old covenant, if you believed Moses, you would believe in me because he wrote of me. He spoke of me. He made it clear what I was going to be like when I got here. And if you were studying Deuteronomy 18 and, and open to what it has to say, you would abundantly understand that I am the fulfillment of Moses' prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. And so they were covenant apostates. They walked away from their own scriptures in order to deny Christ. And, of course, Jesus, I've already given you one quote where he says, if you believe Moses, you'd also believe me. But here's Jesus saying the same thing long before the book of Revelation was written, decades before the book of Revelation was written. Matthew 23, 35, you scribes and Pharisees. Now, I'm, I'm inserting those words because if you go back to the context, you'll see that at the beginning of chapter three, 23, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes. You Pharisees and scribes will be held responsible for the murder of all godly people of all time. From the murder of righteous Abel, remember when that took place? <laughs> all the way back, the first two boys that were ever born. So the first children, as far as we know, of Adam and Eve. From the murder of righteous Abel to the murder of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you killed in the temple between the sanctuary and the altar. And then verse 36, I tell you the truth. This judgment will fall on this very generation. So if there's ever a time stamp in the scriptures, this is one of them. And there are a lot of time stamps, all of which point to one generation in Jesus' day receiving this judgment from God. Not in some future time that is still future for even people like us 2,000 years later, but rather uh, a time in one generation this would come. Now back to today's text. 
Revelation 8, 13. Then I looked and I heard on an eagle, that is a, an angel, and, and the more you study the original text there, the more you discover that it really is an angel, a cherub, or an angel, not an actual like bald eagle or a golden eagle. It wasn't that kind of an eagle. It was a, an angel crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So what we've done is we've got seven trumpets, we've got four who've blown, now we're ready for the fifth trumpet. And what's fascinating, when we get to chapter 9, the fifth trumpet says that when he blew it, a star fell from heaven. An angel fell from heaven. That would be Satan himself. And uh, I'm not obviously not reading that passage for the sake of time, but if you read it, chapter 9, starting verse 1, you'll notice that he's permitted to release demons from the abyss to torture apostate Israel. I I'm fascinated by the way the Gospels kind of add things, like uh, we, there's, most scholars would agree that Mark is the first. It's the shortest and the simplest. Matthew's comes next, and he gives us a lot more information than we find in Mark. What's fascinating is Luke gives us even more information, and so we have that story of Jesus casting the demons out of the man who was called Legion. Remember that? So a, a Roman legion was 6,000 uh, soldiers, so approximately 6,000 soldiers. So this man was so full of demons that, that they actually told Jesus, our name is Legion. There are thousands of us in this man. Please don't cast us out unless you can give us some place to go, give us, put us in the pigs. So Mark says, they just say, don't cast us out unless you can give us a place to go. Let, let us go into these pigs. And so Jesus says, go. But in Luke, which comes later, actually probably significantly later, Luke says that, the, that these uh, demons say, please do not cast us into the abyss. In other words, don't put us in the eternal prison where we'll be completely forbidden to even do anything on earth. Now, they got cast into the abyss anyway because when the pigs died, where else were they going to go? But I'm just saying that he is permitted to release demons from the abyss to torture apostate Israel. So notice then, and, and I want to bring out another scripture, another point here, and I want you to take this to heart if I can. If, if I can get you to do this, please take this to heart. Most of the time, if we ask someone, where are the prophetic passages in the Gospels? Anybody who's read the Gospels at all, they'll quickly say, oh, well, you find the prophetic part in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. And that's true in the sense that there are three chapters there, one chapter in each of those three Gospels that focus on prophecy. So in that sense, they're right. But in another sense, they're not completely right because one of the things that I've only in recent years thoroughly begun to understand, and I don't even understand it yet, not thoroughly, but I've begun to really see it. And that is that the, th the three Gospels, actually all four, but especially the first three, the three Gospels are filled with prophetic passages, all of them pointing straight to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So look at Matthew 12. What happens is we oftentimes will take a passage uh, that, that talks about, well, you'll see it in just a moment, that talks about a spiritual truth. For example, here, or the passage where Jesus talks about the narrow way and the straight gate and so forth, and we think, oh, that's really important in terms of evangelism, that it's not enough, for example, just to get rid of bad habits. It's not enough just to get rid of any demons that might be in you. You need to fill that empty space with Jesus, or else demons will come back, and the end of your life will be worse than the first. But notice that Jesus is not talking about personal lives here. He's talking about a generation. He's talking about a nation. Notice what happens. Matthew 12, 43. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes and finds the house empty, swept, and put in order, then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. We usually stop reading right there, and we apply it to individuals. Sure, it's not enough just to clean up your life. You need to fill your life with God's holiness. You need to fill your life with God's presence. You need to fill your life with Jesus. Otherwise, your end may, be, it may end up being worse than your beginning. But that's not what Jesus had, Jesus had in mind. How does he finish? Where, where does he make the application? So also will it be with this evil generation. In other words, you think you're cleaning the house and you've got everything in order and you've got the most beautiful building on planet Earth. And honestly, by the time Herod got through enlarging and beautifying the temple, it was recognized in its day as the most beautiful building on Earth in the, in the entire Roman Empire. But Jesus says it's not enough just to sweep everything up and make everything pretty. 
if you don't fill your life with me as a nation, if you do not believe in me as a nation, this generation, if you reject me, will be, your end will be worse than the first, and, and specifically with a view of being filled with demonic beings, in, in, controlled by demonic beings. And that's exactly what chapter 9 is telling us was happening in Israel, in Judah, in Jerusalem. They were, the demons were being released, and if you read Josephus during that period, we just don't have time to do that. If I read all that, we'd have to, it'd take 40 weeks instead of nine weeks to finish everything. But honestly, read Josephus, and you'll discover the demonic evil that reigned in Jerusalem over the last several years before its destruction is completely described for us or hinted at and prophesied here in chapter 9. Let's look at the locust because, again, I don't have time to read all of it, but I'm summarizing what it does when it describes this plague of locusts. So, as I say as here, as it's described, they are nightmares beyond the imaginations of any Hollywood horror movie. They look like horses. They wear golden crowns. Remember, they're not men riding horses. They, these are locusts. They look like horses. They, 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 they're wearing golden crowns. They have human faces, hair like women, teeth like lions, breastplates of iron, wings that sound like many chariots rushing into battle, and tails and stings like scorpions. You can see all that when you read the text. Now, what are we going to do with this kind of description? What are we going to do with it? Well, most of the futurists, uh, that is to say, the futurists are those who think that most of Revelation, if not all of Revelation, from chapter 3 on is still in our future. They think most of chapter Matthew 24, Luke 21, these are still in our future. Thousands of years later, these things still have not yet been fulfilled. And so they look into the future. Now, one of the advantages of looking into the future is that you can, uh, you can just make it be anything you want it to be. You know, let your imagination run wild. What are these locusts? Well, we live in a different world than Jesus did, and we try to imagine what would, what would a helicopter look like if it was seen by a first century person who had never even seen a, an automobile, let, never seen an internal combustion engine, let alone uh, see a helicopter. And so uh, the futurist then looks into the future, and Hal Lindsey is one of those. So in 1973, Hal Lindsey wrote what he called a commentary on the book of Revelation. It was more of a commentary on the imaginations of his own mind, frankly. But anyway, on, in 1973, on page 138, he's dealing with this passage in Revelation 9, and he says, I have a Christian friend who was a Green Beret in Vietnam. When he first read this chapter, he said, I know what these are. I've seen hundreds of them in Vietnam. They are Cobra helicopters. Now, this illustrates at once both the advantage of, being, of putting everything into the future. You can let your imagination run wild. But the disadvantage of putting everything into the future is that the future has a way of catching up with you. And so now we realize if, even if it is still future, it won't be Cobra helicopters because Cobra helicopters are obsolete. There are hardly any of them still in existence. The American Air Force has gone way beyond uh, Cobra helicopters, so has the Canadian Air Force. And besides that, a lot of other countries don't even use uh, Bell equipment, you know, Bell, the Bell company that manufactured the, Cobra, the, the Hueys and the Cobras and so forth. But we don't know, you know, you don't, so it, it, it's not going to be that. It, it could be something else, but it's definitely not going to be Cobra helicopters. They are obsolete. Now, because Hal Lindsey is not a complete idiot, he always gives himself some weasel words, a way out if it turns out that he's wrong. So he went on to say that may, be just, that may just be conjecture, that is the idea that these are Cobra helicopters, but it does give you something to think about. A Cobra helicopter does fit the composite description very well. They also make the sound of many chariots. My friend believes that the means of torment will be a kind of nerve gas sprayed from its tail. So you can see, he just goes on speculating, speculating, speculating. I'm tired of speculating. What does God's word have to say? Well, the first principle I'm going to nail down for you, I hope I can nail it down for you, and I'm going to mention it a couple more times today. The first principle is God never needs modern technology to fulfill his promises. There's a, you know, in chapter 11, it talks about the whole world. Again, they get it wrong, and we'll, we'll see that in a minute. But it talks about the, the, t the translation gets it wrong. But the whole world will look at the two dead prophets, and they will be amazed and so forth and, and gratified, and they'll start giving gifts to one another and all that. And I've heard so many. In fact, I remember the first time I was slapped down with this because I, I used to buy the view that I now reject. And I remember saying to a Bible scholar at one point, well, obviously this couldn't happen until there was television. And, and not only just television, there had to be satellite TV. Otherwise, the whole world could not see what's going on in Jerusalem. And he, he looked right at me with a kind of a 
I don't know, like a, he was both mystified and a little bit angry. He says, how dare you declare that God could not fulfill his prophecies unless he has the benefit of modern technology? And that gave me, it was like a slap in the face, but a good slap. You know, one of those bang, bang, slap. Uh, thanks, I needed that. <laughs> I did, because I began to realize that we need to understand God does not need modern technology. Listen, God is the one who flung the universe into existence, who spoke it into existence. God's the one who made everything in your cells, the DNA and everything else. God knows what he's doing. He doesn't need our technology. He's so far beyond our technology that it's not even worth talking about. So what are we seeing then when we see these locusts? Well, first of all, let us not lose track of the fact that these locusts come from the pit of hell. The scripture is right there, verses 1 through 3. They are released with God's permission by Satan himself. Now, what does the Old Testament have to say? Jeremiah 51, 27. Bring up horses like bristling locusts. Now, these are horses that are coming in judgment against Babylon. That's okay. But Christ is now speaking against an Israel that he has emphatically declared has become like Babylon. So, we understand then that this is poetic language from the Old Testament. Joel chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 say, For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are like lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine, now, that would be a reference to Israel itself, and splintered my fig tree, another symbol of Israel. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down, which is how locusts did. You know, when pl plagues came, they would just eat everything. Their branches are made white. And this is from Joel's prophecy of the day of the Lord against Israel. But we're not done yet. Joel goes on in chapter 2 again to complete the description, and it still relates to all that we've just read. Then we need to understand that the Hebrew word for demon actually translates literally as the hairy one, hair like women. And then finally, if we compare 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 5 through 7, and Ezekiel and so forth, there's only one conclusion, and this is that this is a description of a satanic army released by God to come against Israel on the day of the Lord, which occurred in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So God does not need modern technology to fulfill what he has to say here. Now, um, so, uh, so let's move on quickly, I guess. Just Okay, now the, re the next question is, though, why five months? You're looking at Revelation chapter 9, verse 10, where it says, as it says here, they have tails and stings like scorpions and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tail. Why five months? Well, and this is historically significant. First of all, locusts normally appeared between May and September in the Holy Land, but never for the entire five months. They would come through and eat everything and leave all the world bare behind them, but they moved on. But this is an extended plague. You know, sometimes we, we hear... Uh, uh, in a movie or something, they'll talk about, you know, a plague of biblical proportions. This is a five-month-long plague, a plague of truly biblical proportions. And it is interesting that in May of, of AD 66, the Roman procurator, Gessius Florus, terrorized the Jews for five months, beginning in May of that year with the deliberate slaughter of 3,600 peaceful citizens, and he went on for the next five months just as he began. His vicious behavior, historians now say, was intended to incite the Jews into a rebellion against Rome. And it worked. The Jews pushed back. That is, they organized themselves, they fought back against Gessius Florus, and that justified then Rome sending in a real army to occupy the land. And that was the beginning of the end. The Jewish historian Josephus dates the beginning of the Jewish war from this occasion, that is, from the five months of Gessius Florus terrorizing Israel or the, yeah, the land of Israel. So now we come to the sixth trumpet. The four horns of the golden altar before God is referenced there in verse 13. Uh, maybe I'll just read it to you really quickly here. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar from God. Now this is a, a reminder then that judgment is falling on apostate Israel in a response to the prayers of God's new covenant people. We've already talked about that back in chapter 8. But then it talks about in verse 16, as you can see here, the number of mounted troops that were coming up from the Euphrates and so forth. You can see that. You can skim it faster than I can read it. Was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And so the New Living Translation actually does the math and just records it as 200 million mounted troops. 
Now, in 1980, I was serving my very first church as pastor. I'd been an associate pastor for four years prior to that. But in 1979, I became the pastor of a small church out in the country, north uh, in a very rural area, north of Houston, Texas, about 60 miles north of Houston, Texas. And uh, I was privileged to serve there. But in the meanwhile, one of the burdens I had was that Dr. John Bassanio, who was the pastor at the First Baptist Church of, of Houston and a very renowned pulpiteer, an orator of you know, of, of great note, and he really was a, a, an astounding speaker. Um, but his morning service was always on television at 8 o'clock every Sunday night. So my people would come to our evening service. We had evening services back then. They would come to our evening service saying, Preacher, you better hurry up and finish. we got to get home in time to listen to Dr. Bassanio. I was like, what am I, chopped liver? You know, but, but uh, <laughs> we got to get home to, in time to listen to Dr. Bassanio. And, uh, and during 1980, he spent most of that, I think he spent all of that year, preaching through the book of Revelation. But he took the futurist perspective on the book of Revelation. Now, when he got to that number, 200 million mounted troops, and he did the math as well. The New Living Translation wasn't around at that point, but you can do the math. And he did it, and he came up with 200 million mounted troops. And he's like, okay, they're at the river Euphrates. What is, where will we find an army of 200 million? And apparently at that time, the, arm, the Chinese army was attributed to have 200 million soldiers. Not mounted, but soldiers altogether. He said, that's the only place such an army could come from. No other land on earth could even ever hope to put that many people in the field. This has to be the Chinese army coming against Israel. And they will do this in the time of Armageddon. And he believed, and he said so in so many words over and over again, probably within the next 10 years. One of the reasons he was preaching uh, in 1980 about the return of Christ was because he believed it would, he thought the rapture would occur and the, in, and the tribulation would begin sometime before or uh, not, not later than 1988. He thought the generation that Jesus referred to started in 1948. He did the math again, 1988, 40 years later, that would be the end of the world. And uh, of course it was not. So he's looking around for an actual literal army of 200 million soldiers and thought it had to come from China because that's the only country that could even hope to put so many people in the field. All right, let's do some good work for a moment. Notice then that there are actually no numbers in the original text. The literal Greek reads myriads of myriads times two. The other day we were having fun, my, brother, my son and I, with some things, and, and I said, I, I forget the exact context, but I said, well, I, 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 do that, I, I do that more than you do to infinity. You know, and you know how you, when, kids, you know, I, I, when kids joke around, they'll say, you know, I, I hate you to infinity or I love you to infinity, and that means without end. And so I, I put, and he said, he t texted back saying, oh, Dad, that's not fair. You got ahead of me on that. So anyway, um, the, the point is that when you add to infinity, so it, there's no real number there. Myriads of myriads times two is like saying to infinity. There's no real number there. It's a number that no man, it's an uncounted number. It's a vast host. And isn't it interesting that in Psalm 68, verse 17, the Psalm says the chariots of God are double myriads, thousands of thousands. They don't mean a literal number. They just mean an extraordinary number that you can't even count. So what are we learning then? We're learning that biblically the Euphrates was the direction from which armies of God's judgment came against Israel. And this judgment then is going to come against Israel both from Rome and it's going to be demonic as well. And there's no end of the number of demons that are involved here. We just don't know. All right. So, but notice then the blindness of the judge. We're about to move to chapter 10. Can you believe we're just about halfway through today's lesson and we're about three quarters of the way through with our time, but uh, I, I'm going to move faster in just a moment. Revelation 9:20. But the people who did not die in these awful plagues that are described here in chapter 9, the demonic nature of it, the locusts and so forth, they still refused to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. Folks, unless you are supernaturally aided by God's Holy Spirit, you cannot repent, you will not repent. And these people were under what is sometimes the, the theologians have a term for it, judicial blindness where God says, I'm removing my spirit from you altogether, and you will not be able to see the truth, and you will remain in your sin, and the judgment will pile up against you, and it will cast you out of my presence forever. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that neither see, can neither see, nor hear, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their witchcraft or their sexual immorality or their thefts. 
May I point out that the more you look into those that are kind of leading, I don't know how to describe it, I don't know if you want to call it the, the, the reset people or the, the new world order people, but those that are leading this, you don't have to dig very deeply to discover that they are incredibly sexually perverted. Whether we're talking about Bill Gates or Jeffrey Epstein or Bill Clinton or all these people at the Davos uh, Economic Forum or Davos, however you say it, Economic Forum, these people are incredibly sexually perverted. And when you look at some of their faces, you think, you know, they, there's this kind of a blankness, a kind of a, I don't even know how to describe it, a lack of aliveness in their faces that indicate there may be demonic beings going on there at work in their lives, inhabiting their, their bodies and so forth. Um, and, uh, and, and, of course, one of the other things we know is that they are entirely casual about taking human life. They, they do everything they do in order to, quote, save the planet, but they don't mind to kill millions of people if, if that leads to saving the planet. So we're seeing then a repeat of something today that was dealt with a long time ago, but the principle is still there. The, the principle of victory is still there as well, and these people will not prevail. Let me assure you of something. The reset's not going to happen, not in any final sense. It'll, it may be applied here or there. The new world order may be applied here and there to some degree, but it's not going to happen in a final sense. Our Lord reigns. Now let's move to chapter 10. Verse 1, John says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face shone like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire, and in his hand was a small scroll that had been opened. He stood with his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he gave a great shout like the roar of a, of a lion, and when he shouted, the seven thunders answered. And let's continue reading. When the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders said and do not write it down. Now, we'll get back to the main part of the text, but we're just going to spend a moment talking about the significance of the seven thunders, partly because it is, again, astounding. Just like the commentators tend to let their imaginations go crazy over what the locusts represent, they let their imaginations go crazy over the 30 minutes of silence in heaven. They also let their imaginations go crazy over what the seven thunders might have said. But God gives us his word in order that his word can comment on his word and the best way to understand what the word says is to let the word tell you what the word says and so let's look at the seven thunders in light of what the bible says so chapter 10 verse 4 the seven thunders first of all let's look at the word sealed for a moment and you go back to daniel chapter 12 and you're going to notice that what daniel saw and heard he is commanded to seal up until the time of the end the words are sealed until the time of the end now, Revelation 10, 4, John is told to seal up what the seven thunders have said. But what's interesting is, by way of contrast, when we get to the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 10, last chapter, not the last words, but the last chapter, there John is instructed, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. So what are we learning here then? Daniel makes it clear that things that are sealed are to be withheld until the time for their prophesied action when it's near, when it's almost on you. The seven thunders then must have spoken of things that are still yet to be in our future. I agree. 2,000 years later, we still don't know what the seven thunders said because God sealed them up because they are about some distant future time. And Daniel is not to confuse his people with the distant future because the book of Revelation is written for the near future. So... The book of Revelation was not sealed. Its prophecies were to be fulfilled in John's near future and his readers' near future at the time when his audience would still be living. Now let's carry on with our text. Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand toward heaven. He swore an oath in the name of the one who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in it. That would be God, of course, and the sea and everything in it. He said there will be no more delay when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will, be, it will happen just as he announced it to his servants, the prophets. Now, what we're seeing here is a description of the angel of the Lord as he judges Israel. The angel of the Lord being Jesus Christ himself. So, 
we don't even have to look far. What's your first clue as to who this mighty angel is who comes down with these gigantic pillar legs and stands on the sea and the land and so forth? His face shone like the sun. His feet were like pillars of fire. If you go back and read the descriptions of the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament, if you read chapter 1 of Revelation, you understand this is Jesus. And then he swore. Now, if he's Jesus, he's God in the flesh. And so, as you can see then in Hebrews 6.13, where the writer says there that God had to swear by himself since there was no one greater to swear by. So this is more proof this is Jesus. Jesus, God the Son, is swearing by God the Father that the time, the delay is just about up. There will be no more delay meaning final judgment against Israel would soon come. Now, let me just interrupt to say that, again, one of my pet peeves, and my dear wife has to hear me expound on this from time to time, um, if, if there's anyone who's ever, whose patience would ever earn their way into, into heaven, there she is right there sitting in front of you over to my left. But, uh, but she is so patient with me, she lets me preach to her even when I don't have anybody else to preach to. And, and uh, sometimes she'll say, okay, I've heard that before, but, but most of the time she just lets me go on. But one of my pet peeves is the fact that as wonderful as the King James Version of the Bible is, um, I'm sorry, there are some bad translations that have given rise to a lot of bad ideas because of the English, not because of the original language. And so uh, notice then that the, the scripture says that there will be, that the angel, this is Jesus, says, there will be no more delay. The judgment that I've been threatening against Israel since, since I was walking on earth 40 years ago, 35 years ago, that judgment is coming quickly. It'll come in the next five years. It'll come in 70 AD. There will be no more delay. But remember what the King James says, something to the effect of time was no longer to be, which gives everybody the sense that that's the end of the world. Time will no longer, you know, uh, there was even a gospel song that I used to sing uh, uh, years ago, and, and uh, that, that that would be, you know, the time was no, the angel said that the time was no longer to be, and oh, what a weeping and wailing when the lost were told of their fate. They cried for the rocks in the mountains. They they prayed, but their prayers were too late. It, it, it's, a, it's a great song. It's just theologically wrong <laughs> because it's not about time ending, but rather there's no more delay is what the actual text means, meaning the final judgment would come soon. And then I want, uh, and then of course there's some scriptures there that you can compare as well. But but uh, especially when we get to the word, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, let me just, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself there. The word is followed by the full revelation of the mystery. Let's back that up for just a second. Uh, sorry, Cynthia, just back back it up a little bit. She's doing it. She's doing good. Um, she's very alert. I can, every time I look back there, boy, her eyebrows are up, and she's she's paying. <laughs> thank you so much, by the way, for working so hard week after week. I deeply appreciate what you're doing to make it possible for it to communicate from here to there and back to this screen so everybody can see it. All right. So um, so anyway, notice then, final judgment against Israel would come soon, followed by the full revelation of the mystery of Christ in the new covenant. Now that's in verse seven. You'll see it there in chapter 9, verse 7, uh, I'm sorry, ver chapter 10, verse 7. But in that day, in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced. The mystery of God fulfilled, just as he announced. Now, what are we talking about? Well, that's explained for you in detail in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. But let me give you verse 6, because here it is in a nutshell. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That's the mystery. No longer do you have the Jews over here and everybody else is Gentiles out in, you know, out, out in, in outer darkness. Rather, all of a sudden, by faith in Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile come together in one people of God known as the church, and we are then in Christ and we are his people forever. Now we carry on quickly, the new covenant scroll. Uh, then the voice from heaven spoke to me again, go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who's standing on the sea. I'm skipping down to the colored part. Eat it. It will be sweet as honey, but it will turn sour in your stomach, and that's exactly what happened. But let me explain the new covenant scroll. First of all, this is essentially the book that announces the end of the old covenant and the establishment of new, the new, in other words, the book of Revelation, essentially. And when John is told to eat it, I wish I had time to expound on this because I think this is an extraordinarily important understanding of how the inspiration of Scripture works. God's prophets were to digest his truth so that when they delivered it, it came from both God and man. 
That's one reason why we can say when Isaiah wrote his prophecy, boy, does it sound like Isaiah. It doesn't sound like anybody else. When Jeremiah wrote his prophecy, it sounds like Jeremiah. It doesn't sound like anybody else. Ezekiel is just kind of a crazy guy and, do, and writing all kinds of crazy stuff. It sounds like Ezekiel. Doesn't sound, it definitely doesn't sound anybody, like anybody else. You, you never confuse Paul and John. Their writings just sound different. Why? Because as God's prophets, each one of these men has absorbed God's truth into them and then empowered by the Holy Spirit, still writing from their own understanding, but a supernatural understanding enabled by God, what comes out of their mouths or what comes out of their pen as they write it is the very word of God. So John is told to eat this book and then to preach the truth. This is the mystery of inspiration. He says it'll be sweeter than honey. Why is that? Because nothing is sweeter than the promises and blessings of the new covenant. But it'll be sour in your stomach. Why? Because nothing is more heartbreaking than to have to prophesy about and then see the horrible end of your nation as the covenant people of God as John had to do. And there are some parallel passages that describe the same experience for Ezekiel, and you can read those at another time. Now chapter 10, verse 11, Then I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. The establishment of the new covenant then hinged upon three things all prophesied in Revelation. That is, first, the total destruction of old covenant Israel. Secondly, opening the door of the establishment of a worldwide people of God, that is, Gentiles and Jews together in the church. Thirdly, the weakening of Rome's self-confidence and pride so that it could be overcome by the church in the next 300 years. All that in Revelation. Then the measuring of the temple. Uh, John is told to rise up and measure the temple and so forth. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses. I'm going to move really quickly through this, and I think we're going to be done in just about five or six minutes. So please don't panic, Diana. Okay. Uh, but I want you to notice the contrast between the measurements here. First of all, he said, God says, measure the temple of God. But if you read the text, and I wish we had time, he says, do not measure the court outside the temple Leave that out, or literally, and the Greek word is ekbalo, which means to throw or to cast out. Remember when the, the man who the blind man was healed, and, and he said, you know, that Jesus had healed him, and they said, well, You're not one of us, and it says they cast him out of the temple. The, the word literally means they picked him up by his clothing. Two or three men together picked him up by his clothing and hurled him down the steps of the temple. He was cast out. Ek balo, the Greek, Greek word, same word that's here. Leave that out. Cast that out. In other words, cast out the people, the, the apostate, covenant-breaking people of God. So you see it here. Measuring the temple then is a biblical indication that God is drawing lines to separate the godly from the ungodly. Just as the court outside the temple is to be given over to the nations, so also the wicked, unbelieving, covenant-breaking Jews will be cast out of the new covenant temple church. We're not talking about a, an actual building now. We're talking about the covenant temple church that you and I are part of today. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16? You are that temple, John says, uh, Paul says. So anyway, to be trampled by the, the Gentiles, and there's more scriptures you can study for yourself there. So that in Luke 13, 28, we read, and I'm, I'm summarizing by bringing one verse out of the reference that I've given you just above. In that day, Jesus says, you will see weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out, ek balo, picked up by your clothing and just hurled out of the, out of the people of God. By the way, this is the reference. If you go and look back at the rest of Luke 13, you're going to see that Jesus is talking about the narrow way and the straight gate. He's talking about few there be that find it, etc., etc. He's talking about Israel and how few Jews are actually going to believe in him. While there is a principle there that you and I need to get into our heads, that there is, there is something, you know, there's a price to be paid to walk with Jesus on the narrow way. And God, and God has that for us in that passage because all of God's words kind of have universal application in one sense. But the precise application that Jesus gives it is that of judgment against Israel as it comes in 70 AD. And then we're just about done, the two witnesses. I wish we had time to read about them. I'll just give you the reference here. I'll give you the, the, the outline of what, what we're looking at, and you can read it for yourself. They symbolize the prophetic witness against Israel. They're not two actual witnesses in those last days. God's prophets essentially served as covenant lawyers, prosecutors against God's own people. Many Old Testament images are implied in this passage about the two witnesses. 
For example, the olive trees and the lampstands from Zechariah 4, which we looked at a few weeks ago, represent the witness and work of God's Holy Spirit throughout the history of Israel, always pointing to them toward Jesus of Nazareth as their coming Messiah. You know, Jesus said to the two on the road to Emmaus, how, how you fools, you are slow of heart, you, you still don't believe how all the scriptures in the Old Testament speak about me. It's there if you just have eyes to see, and then he explains it to them. In grace, he explains it to them. But they also represent the two anointed ones in Zechariah 3 and 4, that is to say Israel's priests and kings, who were both tasked. If you go back and read the Old Testament, you'll see in Deuteronomy, they're both tasked to maintain Israel's spiritual life, and of course both failed. And they also represent Moses and Elijah, these two witnesses, which again stands for both the writing prophets, like Moses who wrote the first five books of the Bible, but also Isaiah and Jeremiah, but also, and others, but also the, uh, the, act, the, the, the speaking prophets like Elijah and Elisha who didn't write anything, but uh, who, who had plenty to say and plenty to do. Then fire proceeds from their mouths and, and you can see how uh, this is exactly the way it works, but also don't forget Jeremiah 5.14 that says God's word is like a fire, and it is like a fire. Actually, the reason I'm in the ministry today is because of, of, of a man named uh, Gene Chisholm, uh, was my pastor all through my high school years. He had memorized vast portions of the Bible, and probably the last five to ten minutes of every sermon he preached would be just one scripture after another quoted, ref referencing relevant to the topic of the day, whatever it was, but he would quote scripture after scripture after scripture. And remember how Jesus, when he taught those two on the road to, to Emmaus, said, did not our hearts burn with us as he talked with us as we walked by the way? And that's the same thing that happened to me Sunday after Sunday. He would just start pouring this scripture out from his own heart, saying it with feeling and with the right emphasis. He was an excellent speaker. And as he would use the word of God, my heart was set on fire. God's word is like a fire. But let's remember that fire is both, it can be a healing thing, it can be a cleansing thing, it can also be a judging thing and a destroying thing. And so God's word is like a fire. And they will bring many of the plagues of Egypt against Jerusalem before its destruction, which is the great tribulation. And then I would say that these two summarize all the witnesses of the Old Testament, including John the Baptist, who was the last Old Testament prophet. But we've got to go a little bit farther. Not only do these two witnesses sum up the previous witnesses, they point to uh, the, the, the previous witnesses to Israel's covenant faithlessness, they point to Jesus. And he sums up everything in himself. He's the new Moses and the new Elijah. He's the new Israel. He's the new temple. He's the living recapitulation of the entire history of Exodus. He's the focus of the world's hatred toward God from both Jew and Gentile. He is finally our victory, and in him we rise to sit with him on his throne and reign. His enthronement then as it's referred to in, in, in Acts chapter, chapter 2, his enthronement becomes the crack of doom for Israel. So we now come to the seventh trumpet, the fifth kingdom which prophesied, okay, we're out of time. What, what does that mean? I'm done? Okay, if I go two minutes more, maybe three, okay. All right, the seventh trumpet. The fifth kingdom then is prophesied by Daniel. Just look at it again, chapter 11, uh, verse 15 there. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, what do I mean by the fifth kingdom, then, that is prophesied by Daniel? Well, if you'll remember, Daniel mentions in chapter 2, as he explains Nebuchadnezzar's dream to Nebuchadnezzar, he says, There are four kingdoms that are coming. There's yours, then after that comes Persia, then Greece, then Rome. Four kingdoms. But then... There's going to be in a, a fifth kingdom. And remember, Daniel says, you saw a stone cut out of a mountain without hands, and it smashed the, king, the, the feet of that statue that represented the, the four previous kingdoms. It smashed those, that idol so that it fell, and all those kingdoms were blown away like so much dust on the wind. And then that stone grew to be a mountain that filled the whole earth. This is the first representation of the kingdom of God in Christ. And so that's the stone that grew to be a mountain. And so Christ's kingdom then, which is revealed on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 32 and 33, is confirmed before the world in his judgment of Jerusalem. In, in, uh, if you were in, a, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Christ's resurrection, then you would have understood the coming of his kingdom, but the whole world was forced to see it in, God, in his judgment on Jerusalem. Ch chapter 11, verse 18, recall, records the fulfillment of the promises that are found in Acts 2. 11, 19 reveals the true temple is in heaven. And how do we know that? Partly because the Ark of God's Covenant is now in heaven, never again to appear on earth, 
with the clear implication that no physical temple will ever again be built on earth. I don't have time, but I've got books at home, more than one, where different men have, have said, and they've written little pamphlets saying, ah, we've discovered the Ark of the Covenant where Jeremiah hid it at the destruction of Babylon, or destruction by Babylon in 586 B.C. We've found the Ark of the Covenant. Now we can, oh, sorry, now we can rebuild the temple. I just want to turn with you for just a moment to Jeremiah 3. It's funny to me that the only thing Jeremiah says about the Ark of the Covenant just give me a second to find it here. The only thing Jeremiah says about the Ark of the Covenant is that it's gone and gone forever. Listen to this. And when you have multiplied, I'm reading Jeremiah 3.16 as you've got the reference right there. And when you have multiplied and been fruitful in the land in those days, declares the Lord, they shall no more say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed. It shall not be made again. You know why it's not going to be made again? Because it was never unmade. It was taken to heaven and revealed to us in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Now remember, we are seated with Christ in heaven now, Ephesians 2, 6, and thus we reign with him even now. So the fifth kingdom prophesied by Daniel is established. And because we are in Christ, our worship in he is, is heavenly worship. And you need to understand that. That when you, if you are in Christ, when you go into a worship service, whether we're talking about what's going to happen in the next hour or whether we're talking about a small group worshiping together in a home, wherever you're worshiping God, you are in Christ and you are in his throne room. You're not just in his throne room. You're seated with him on his throne. Remember what we used to say about that? What did we begin by saying? That worship is powerful. It has cosmological significance. It can change the history of the world. Let us learn to worship before the throne. And that's it. Our assignment for next Sunday, July the 10th, is to read chapters 12, 13, and 14. Just three. I asked you to read four this week. You did it. You did well. You get 100%. I'll give you a gold star if you'll bring me a gold star. And, uh, and uh, anyway, but this time read chapters 12, 13, and 14. And I'll give you a couple things to work on. Ponder the fourfold significance of the woman in chapter 12. And um, it's not just verse 1, but it starts there. And consider the mark of the beast. And this is something I hope I've introduced that's new to you. In the light of the principle that God does not need modern science to fulfill his prophecies. How many times have you heard somebody say the mark of the beast will be some kind of a, a chip that will be inserted in your hand or into your forehead and they can read the chip. They can track you everywhere you go. I'm not saying there aren't evil men who try to track people. And there may be chips, but that's not the mark of the beast. We'll talk more about that next week. As I say, that is it. We is done. Let's thank the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you that we could go so quickly through these four chapters, too quickly to, to in any way uh, assume it into ourselves, Father. We haven't assimilated what we've heard. I just pray, Lord, that you'll help us all to keep studying your word and reading it prayerfully, but also thoughtfully. And the whole word, Old Testament as well as New, until the, the unified message of your unified scriptures comes thoroughly into our hearts and transforms us into a people that are prepared to trust you to help us to win the world in the most literal sense to disciple the nations until the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our, of our Lord and of his Christ. And it's with that thought in mind we give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your patience. No song. I knew we would take maximum time today, so there's no song to listen to at the end of this service. <laughs>